Although the majority of weapons, armor, and accessories can be acquired from treasure chests, bought in shops, or obtained after defeating strong enemies, early on in the life cycle of the Final Fantasy franchise, the developers also introduced another method of acquisition, stealing. Often aligned with the thief job and characters like Zidane and Riku who adopted the job, stealing would give players the chance to obtain powerful gear much earlier in the game than it could be acquired through natural progression, but only if they were lucky patient, and studious enough. Players would need to have knowledge about upcoming enemies and bosses, and the potential steals that might be available, as there might often only be one chance to get it right. But even if they possessed the right knowledge, if Lady Luck was not on their side, they could still end up leaving empty-handed. But due to the rewards on offer, stealing is a pretty invaluable tactic for those looking to become overpowered, and in today's video, we're going to run through some of the most powerful items that can be stolen across the entire franchise. But before we kick things off with the Robe of Lords from Final Fantasy IX, a thank you to our Patreon community for suggesting that we make a video on this topic. Now the Robe of Lords is without question one of the best pieces of armour in Final Fantasy IX that could be worn by mages. It provided the highest defence and magic defence, nullified all incoming wind damage, and provided a plus one stat boost to strength, speed, magic, and spirit. On top of that, it could also be used to grant access to two very powerful support abilities, Concentrate, which would raise the strength of a whole host of curative spells, and Reflect Null, which, as the name suggested, would nullify Reflect if, of course, an enemy had attempted to utilise it for defensive purposes. By wearing the Robe of Lords, characters like Garnet and Queena would see significant benefit, with there also being the option to have Vivi and Ica wear it too. And the good thing is that as there were four potential wearers, the game provided numerous methods of acquisition, and three could be acquired via stealing. Towards the latter part of the game, players would square off against three very powerful foes, Quail, Hades, and Ozma. Each would be challenging in their own right, with Ozma, of course, taking the crown. And during each fight, players would be granted the chance to steal a robe of lords. But they would need to get incredibly lucky. When fighting against Quail and Hades, the steal rate would be only 0.39%, so around a 1 in 257 chance. Against Ozma, the rate was made a bit nicer, raised to 25%, as Dark Matter and the Pumice Piece were added as rarer steals. But the odds were still not that great, especially as turns would need to be sacrificed against a rather unforgiving foe. It's understandable then that many would want to consider alternative routes for acquiring the Robe of Lords, and those routes would include exchanging 10,000 of your hard owned points from Chocobo Hot and Cold, retrieving all the Stellazio coins, and synthesizing it via Hades' shop after the super boss had been defeated, of course. After being introduced in Final Fantasy V, Gilgamesh has gone on to become part of the very fabric of the Final Fantasy franchise, and we even created a video a few years ago to break down the complete evolution of Gilgamesh across the multitude of games in which he has featured. But even though Gilgamesh has now appeared in a ridiculous number of games, the original appearance will always be special due to his corny dialogue and the opportunities he afforded to astute players. Genji armor was introduced in Final Fantasy III, before returning in Final Fantasy IV. In each instance, the set of armor could be obtained within specific dungeons through pretty conventional means, but when it returned in Final Fantasy V, not only was it given a loose place within the narrative, as it's said to have been passed down through generations to warriors who proved their worth in battle, the only way to acquire the various parts of the set was to steal them from Gilgamesh across the many, many encounters you would end up having. Now we could have boiled this down to picking one particular piece of the set, but as they all end up being the best piece of armour available within their respective categories, both in terms of defensive qualities, but also because they could provide immunity to either confuse, toad, mini or paralyze, it felt more prudent to just include the entire set. When Final Fantasy IV was first released, the notion of using the still command to acquire powerful weapons and armour was put to limited use. But when the Final Fantasy IV Remake came out some time later on the Nintendo DS, the developers adapted to the more modern approach. This saw a significant expansion to the amount of weapons and armour that could be stolen from enemies throughout each playthrough, and perhaps the most powerful was the Runax. 
In the original game, the rune axe could be wielded by Cain, Cecil, and Sid, and it would have a strong attack with extra damage dealt when fighting against mages, but it could only be acquired via drops from the Armor Construct, Armored Fiend, and the Iron Giant. In the remake, some elements of this were retained, such as who could wield the rune axe and its extra damage against mages, but its attack damage was increased, and it also provided a significant boost to strength and stamina while seeing a reduction in speed, intellect, and spirit. It could also be acquired as a drop from the armor construct, with the drop rate still being 0.4%. But the big change was that the rune axe could no longer be found as a drop from the iron giant, where in the original it had a 12.5% chance of being acquired. To compensate, it could now be stolen from the armored fiend, as opposed to being a drop and the steal rate was made a little bit higher, sitting at 1%, as opposed to that 0.4% drop rate. Still not great, but at least it provided a bit of variety compared to the original, even if it did make the rune axe much harder to obtain in general. Final Fantasy VII featured an absolute boatload of armor, each with pros and cons that included defense, magic defense, materia slots, materia growth, stat bonuses, and elemental resistances. With each potential upgrade, players would need to consider what they were attempting to achieve at that given moment, and when opting to equip the Zedric, that was very much the case. It featured almost unparalleled defense and magic defense, half the damage of pretty much every single elemental spell and attack featured in the game, even those associated with the hit, punch, and shoot elements, and would grant the wearer a 20 point boost in their strength and magic attributes. The trade off was that it would not allow any materia to be used for that equipment slot. This made the Zedric a very powerful piece of armor, should the use of materia not be of huge importance, but it could only be acquired through stealing. During each playthrough of Final Fantasy VII, it would be possible to gain three separate Zedric, as one could be stolen from Rude in each of the second, third, and fourth encounters against a rather stylish member of the Turks. The only slight issue was that only one of these fights was mandatory, but if you had the required knowledge and patience, then it would be possible to equip the entire party with the Zedric. Ever since its appearance in the original Final Fantasy, the Ribbon has been a sought-after piece of equipment due to it often being able to nullify elemental damage and negative status effects. Due to its powerful utility, the acquisition of the Ribbon was often made quite difficult. This meant it would either appear in the final dungeon, guarded by a tough boss, would have a pretty low drop rate, or would require the player to steal from a venomous foe. In the latter category, there are a few options to choose from, but we've decided to go for the ribbon that appears in Final Fantasy XII, the Zodiac Cage, and that's because alongside providing protection against status ailments, it also granted access to Libra and Regen. The most common method of acquisition would be defeating the level 99 Red Chocobo, but outside of that, it would either need to be found through the Lottery of the Treasure Chest system, as a reward as part of the Hunt Club, or via stealing when taking part in Trial Mode. And in that regard, there would be three separate opportunities, with it possible to steal ribbons from Hashmel, who appeared during Trial 49, the level 99 Red Chocobo, who appeared during Trial 93, and a Mega Mark 12, who appeared as the encounter for Trial 99. With Hashmel being the weakest, if players are strong enough, then repeating Trial 49 gives them the best chance of farming ribbons so that the entire party is protected with optimal efficiency. Due to there being so many jobs available for players to choose from, Final Fantasy Tactics featured a ridiculous number of weapon types. Each category also housed a considerable volume of weapons, and it meant that there were numerous methods of acquisition afforded to the player. This was then expanded even further with the release of War of the Lions on the PlayStation Portable, as players could take part in Rendezvous, a mode that allowed players to team up with their friends, and it was here that they would be able to find rare gear within treasure chests or as rewards for their victories. But in the original game, due to Rendezvous not being available, some weapons could only be acquired through more subtle means, and one such weapon was the famed Masamune. Fresh off its association with Sephiroth, which thrust the Masamune into popular culture, within the original version of Tactics, it was the second strongest available katana. But it could not be bought or found, and would instead need to be obtained when squaring off against Marquis Mesem Elmdor. During the first battle against Elmdor, he would use the Masamune as his main weapon, and it was during this fight that it would need to be stolen. If you missed that chance, the only other opportunity players would have to obtain the Masamune would be catching it when thrown by a ninja who was above level 95 during encounters in Midlight Steep. And that brings us on to the last entry in our list, 
Although due to the situation revolving around their acquisition and their relative power, we're going to include two weapons, Ragnarok and Ultima Weapon, both from Final Fantasy VI Advance. As two of the game's ultimate weapons, Ragnarok and Ultima Weapon were very helpful weapons to have equipped on either Terra, Locke, Edgar or Celes, but on a typical playthrough you could only obtain one of each through conventional means. You could, however, obtain a second version of each weapon during the final boss encounter, as Ragnarok could be stolen from Lady and Ultima Weapon could be stolen from Rest. Each had an 87.5% chance of being stolen, so the developers were being very generous here, and that's because Final Fantasy VI had the ability to change equipment mid-battle, so if you were successful in the original game, you could then square off against Kefka with a suite of ultimate weapons at your disposal. We've gone with Final Fantasy VI Advance though, because in that version of the game, you'd get to keep the weapons you stole during the final encounter as long as you saved your clear file afterwards. You could then choose to tackle the Dragon's Den with your newly acquired weapons, or go back to fight Kefka again and steal even more ultimate weapons, if you so desired. And with that, I think we're done. They were seven of the most powerful things you can steal across the entire Final Fantasy franchise. Be sure to let us know in the comments below which weapons, armor and accessories you've taken the time to steal over the years, and of course, if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Anthony Hoffman, Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Ericris C. Delroet and Gregory, who are super special Onion Knight supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.